Thank you for coming to the session. This is such an exciting conference. I couldn't sleep last night for thinking about how I would love to teach science and all the wonderful things that, that they have now to do that. But let's get started right away because I have so much I want to share with you. But the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like you to take a pretest. And I strongly encourage you to just, on scratch paper, write down true or false so you can see how many trues you get and how many falses you get as we go through this little pretest, okay? So we're going to take a quick true or false test. Students can learn something without actively paying attention to it. True or false? We use only 10% of our brains, of our brain. Understanding a student's learning style can help us teach them better. True or false? Physical activities that cross the midline, such as brain gym, help students learn better through integration of left and right brain. You know where they do this kind of thing. OK, true or false. Some people are more left-brained, and some are more right-brained. Drinking fewer than six to eight glasses of water a day can cause the brain to shrink. Male and female brains are different, and we should adjust our teaching accordingly. It is helpful to determine which of the multiple intelligences students have. The more dendrites children grow, the better. And finally, Education cannot address learning difficulties caused by developmental brain differences. What are those? Well, I researched developmental dyslexia, which means they were born that way. It wasn't from a head injury. So basically, education cannot address learning differences caused by the way someone is born. True or false? OK. Now, would you like to find out the answer to the questions? It's very simple, because they are all false. They are all false. Those are neural myths. Neural myths that have been perpetuated. You know, when I first started speaking about the brain and learning, about 12 or 14 years ago, I could tell an audience pretty much everything we knew. Because a lot of it was done on rats, and there, were, uh, there wasn't much research into actual learning situations at that time. And so some people made some untenable leaps about the classroom at that point. But now we know more. There's been a great deal of research, and we can make some credible leaps to the classroom. And we're going to do that today. But first, we're going to take these myths one by one, and we're going to find out what's really true. Because, you know, there's always a germ of truth in there, right, somewhere. So first of all, students can learn something without actively attending to it. Well, attention drives learning. So we want to focus on selective attention. That's the kind of attention that you use in the classroom, where you're focusing in on something. Now, when you tell students to pay attention, or you say you're going to really pay attention, does that mean taking in more? Is that what attention means? No, it actually means taking in less, less distraction. Attention is kind of a way of throwing away information. Because attention is the way the brain allocates its resources. And in a way, it's similar to a computer and how much RAM. And if you run too many programs, everything slows down. So you can only process so much at a given moment. And attention is the way these resources are allocated. So we want to talk to students about what to pay attention to. And it's more like a spotlight than a floodlight. So it's also an underlying brain process that we could talk a lot more at length. It's very involved in achievement, and it's mediated by the frontal lobes. It's 
An interesting fact is that it's the act of attention that affects plasticity, the, the changes in the brain. You need to pay attention in order to make some of these brain changes. And I'll tell you about a story of hotel maids, hotel cleaning people. They, uh, the researchers followed the group of cleaning people as they did everything that they did. And they translated into how many steps, you know, how far they walked, how much weight they lifted. They translated it into, if you went to a gym, this is what you would have done. Now, the cleaning people were all overweight. When they drew their attention to how hard they were working, what do you think happened? They started losing weight. So when I go up the stairs at my house, I'm like, Stairmaster, Stairmaster, focus on it. OK. But uh, it, attention is important. So we want to focus their attention. Next myth, we only use 10% of our brains. You know, somebody started this a long time ago. And <laughs> it got passed around until we could do neuro neuroimaging and we could look inside the brain and see what was going on. I mean, you might be on cognitive overload now. And if you think you are now, just hang in a little longer and you really will be. So now that we have neuroimaging, we can see even in the resting state, we're using a great deal of the brain. But what many people don't realize when they look at brain scans and say what is activated, is that we set a threshold. Do you see the bar there on the right of the picture to the left? We set a threshold, just like you do with your thermostat at home, and you say, I don't want the air conditioning coming on unless it's 75. Well, we set a threshold so that we can see what is most active and clear out some of the noise, because a great deal of the brain is very active at any time. So if we want to see what working memory, where it's activated, we want to set the threshold so we can see where the brain is most active. And of course, there are many other methods for seeing activation now with PET scans, EEG, DTI. So we're well aware that we're using as much of the brain as we possibly can. Now later, I'm going to show you heavy activation during a learning process with less activation after practice when they are fluent. We're going to look at that. But right now, I'd like you to experience heavy cognitive load so you know what the term means. So we're going to do a little scientific task. And I'm going to put some colors on the screen. Now, it's very important that you each speak out loud and say the colors from left to right as fast as you can. So we're not doing it in unison. It's like a race. It's a fluency task. See how fast you can name the colors out loud, left to right. Now, there's a little catch. You can't read any words, OK? So if the word red is written in blue, what are you going to say? That's right. All right. As fast as you can. Let's go. Faster. No. No, stop. I, I can't take that anymore. I went to a black screen. That's terrible. It's just your colors. OK. But inhibition takes brain energy as well as activation. And you had to inhibit the reading and activate the color. And that increased the cognitive load. So could you feel the effort? Mm -hmm. OK, that's cognitive load, what you felt, that uh, exertion. Did you make any mistakes? Yes. Right. Would you want to read a whole book that way? No. OK, well, now you know what they're going through when they're learning something new, heavy cognitive load, or what your brain is like when you're multitasking. But we won't go into all that. OK. Understanding a student's learning style can help us teach them better. Now, I do applaud the teachers who jumped on the learning styles theory bandwagon early, because they were among the first to realize that students do learn differently, and we want to try and address that. But that was then, and this is now. That was before neuroimaging. 
before we could look inside the brain, when it was thinking or reading or doing math. And we realize now that there is no scientific evidence to support learning styles theory. We are not that simple. We're going to look at some things that show that. You know, students may have preferences, but there is high interconnectivity in the brain. Now, we do want to offer multiple pathways for presentation, working with the material, assessment, but it goes beyond visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, and we're going to look at multiple pathways. Also, when you give students an inventory to see what their learning style is, um, some studies show that they kind of accidentally say what they think they should be, what they want to be, and then we're telling them, you should learn this way and it might not be the best, because we want to bring all the pathways together as much as possible in every lesson. And remember, when you label, you limit. So we want to be very careful. So let's just say no to that, OK? <laughs> let's not do that. And the multiple pathways model that we're going to cover later, you see that visual, auditory, and kinesthetic are part of sensory motor. But there are many other pathways involved in learning. And so we want to broaden our, our uh, strategies for the students. Physical activities that cross the midline, such as brain gym, help students learn better through integration of left and right brain. No. <laughs> Once again, this crossing the midline, doing figure eights, no, that is not, uh, there is no evidence to support that. However, there is evidence to support that exercise helps learning, especially uh, intense or aerobic exercise, even just a few moments of it. So we're not going to do that. Now, aerobic exercise may raise achievement. A meta-analysis of 44 studies by Sibley and Etnier found out that levels of physical activity were related to IQ, achievement, math, and verbal test scores. Even short bouts of an Intense physical activity can help with short and long-term memory. So that is a good thing. Some people are more left-brained and some are more right-brained. No. <laughs> Do you see these quizzes on Facebook? Oh, please, stop this. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to unfriend you, seriously, OK? <laughs> Some occupations usually held by a left brain person include a lab scientist, banker, judge, lawyer, mathematician, librarian, and skating judge. Uh, no, seriously, just stop that. OK. Now, how did that get started, and what part is true? Well, 20-some years ago, Dr. Sperry tried to stop seizures by cutting the corpus callosum that links the left brain and the right brain. So when he did do that, he saw that some, um, some uh, things are lateralized to the left or the right hemisphere in some ways. For example, most language aspects in most people are in the left hemisphere. And we know that the left controls the right side of the body and so forth. But some aspects of language are in the right hemisphere. And they work together. That's what's important to keep in mind. And you can see I have a slice of a real brain here. If you want to see it up close, it'll be at the booth. But you can see that the left and the right hemisphere are linked. OK. So we'll look at that closer later. It's specialized but interactive. So when we label, you know, we limit. Drinking fewer than six to eight glasses of water a day may cause the brain to shrink. I know some elementary schools really push the water. Where there's a difference between thirst and dehydration, serious dehydration. Um, drink water when you're thirsty. Students drink water when they're thirsty. Even too much water can impair thinking, actually. Uh, 
So we just want to ask students to drink when they're thirsty unless they're doing physical things and it's hot or whatever, and then you would monitor that they don't become dehydrated. Male and female brains are different, and we should adjust our teaching accordingly. Well, according to Dr. Cardelia, fine. They're, more sim uh, they're far more similar than different. There's probably more difference between me and you than there are between male and female because we all have some male and some female characteristics. We're all a blend, and they might find differences across groups. But that doesn't mean an individual should be taught a certain way as opposed to another way. And what do I say? When we label, we limit. So we want to offer, again, we want to offer diverse strategies to reach all learners. It is helpful to examine which of the multiple intelligences students have. If, if you're familiar with Dr. Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence theory, uh, he was one of the professors at Harvard Graduate School of Education, Mind, Brain, and Education Institute, when I attended that. And he will tell you there is no neuroscience to support that. Those intelligences don't exist. Preferences exist. Skills exist. Interests exist. But we don't want to be calling them intelligences and, again, labeling and limiting. We want to offer all of these things. I mean, it's a great education theory, okay? And it reminds us how many ways we can address a task and come up with different strategies. So it's fine for that. The more dendrites, the better. Is that true? Actually, the brain goes through periods of growth and then pruning to make itself more efficient. That I usually reserve for early childhood talks to talk about that. But what I wanted to point out to you today, there's a lot of silliness about dendrites. Don't get me started. OK, there's a lot of silliness. And yes, you do grow dendrites when you learn. It is necessary, but not sufficient. So later this morning, we're going to talk about long-term potentiation, LTP, the Hebbian Law, what else is required, what else happens. Education cannot address learning differences caused by developmental brain differences. Well, fortunately, that is so not true. And that is why you are here today, right? because you can make a difference, because the brain is plastic, and it changes all through life. Uh, and this is kind of how it works. When you do more of a behavior, such as practice, you get better at it, right? And then, if you do a great deal of something, it actually gets more real estate in the brain. London taxi drivers have a larger posterior hippocampus. Guitar players have a larger thumb representation. So it gets more cortex. And then as you continue to practice, you form uh, neuronal pathways. You know, for example, the pathway that you have for reading or driving a car has uh, long-term potentiation. It's very well developed. And you create these pathways. So that's what you're, what you're about. You're about changing the brains of the students. And wherever they are, you can take them further, right? 